So Dan, uh, you know, thanks so much for uh, you know doing the interview with us. Um, can you tell us uh, who you are? You know, what your background is? Yeah. So my name is Dan Garfield, and I'm the chief open source officer at CodeFresh, uh, which is abbreviated to COSO or SOSO. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, I'm a co-founder at CodeFresh. Uh -huh. Raziel, the CEO, is uh, really the, the brains behind the operation. And then uh, I'm also an Argo maintainer, though I'm the least of Argo maintainers. And uh, I helped create Open GitOps and the GitOps Working Group and uh, create that standard for GitOps. I do a lot of work with CICD. I do a lot of work with software delivery, enabling companies and helping people improve their software processes and be more secure and deploy more frequently and all that kind of good stuff. Right. Um, so what kind of got you into like the open source space to begin with? Oh gosh. Uh, I started actually working on Helm. Oh really? Uh, but, but not, not that much with code. I mean, I did, I did my first open source commit years ago. I was very proud of it because it was, uh, basically my first open source contribution was for Quake. Okay. Uh, yeah, because somebody nice. was making an HTML5 version of Quake, uh -huh. and I all literally all I did was like fix the launcher so that it worked proper, properly. Right. It was like right. a very small thing, but I well, I loved usable, that. Though, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I loved doing that. Uh, that was like cool to be like, oh, I I contributed to that thing. That was really neat. And you know, my I don't do as much code work these days, but every once in a while here and there, I'll I'll make a, a few commits. But uh, I started working on Helm. Just trying to, we, we, we thought there was definitely a strategic interest in Helm with CodeFresh because we help people deploy to Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Helm is definitely becoming the de facto pro, uh, package manager. Right. And so the shift from Helm 2 to Helm 3 and um, spent a lot of time just honestly just chopping wood and carrying a little little bit of water. Uh -huh. Like, uh -huh. don't ask Karina. She'll be like, yeah. Dan, you didn't do anything. <laughs> Uh, she's not wrong. So, so yeah, we I started doing that, but then um, with Argo, this was a project that came out of a company Applatics. Okay. And they were, they didn't have a commercial path for it, so they were acquired by Intuit. And once they joined Intuit, Intuit donated the project to the CNCF, mm -hmm. and we started contributing pretty much right away. We okay. joined the project, and then we launched the very first commercial version of Argo, like four, five months later, four months later. Oh, wow. So we, we've been doing commercial Argo and we've been helping uh, companies adopt Argo for three years now. So we have more experience in it than any other company. Yeah. We've, yeah. we've done it in more diverse locations, more edge deployments. I, more... Like, I like diverse. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Versus, you know, crazy or insane <laughs> or difficult. Or, yes. Um, uh, well, so let's back up a little bit. What is Argo? So Argo is, uh, as a project, has four tools. The one that people are most familiar with probably is Argo CD, mm -hmm. which is a GitOps tool. So you basically define, this is where I want my software to be deployed. This is the source of truth for that software and this is the policy for how you're gonna keep that in sync. Mm -hmm. And that that shift to GitOps, that's like a pretty revolutionary thing. And I don't mean that because, well, I mean, I, I think you probably know, people were doing stuff like that with Puppet, you yep. know, 15 years ago. I actually, I actually wrote a, uh, what do they call them? Um, uh, plugin, but it's not plugin for uh, Nginx. Oh, uh, yeah. That uh, did some of that. Um, and uh, sorry, fighting with a uh, big truck trying to get over. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, uh, because I didn't want to install Puppet, um, uh, you know, like the, God, I can't think of words today. Um, you know, I didn't want to stop, uh, install the Puppet like client on yeah. all of these machines because I was really afraid of them. Uh, so, you know, so I wrote it. Nginx was already there. So I, uh, you know, wrote a little plugin for Nginx. Went through that, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so a lot of people have, I mean, I think the, you know, like it gets a lot of buzzwords these days of the, you know, configuration as code and all that jazz. Um, but at the same time, it's, um, you know, people don't realize the power of it if you're kind of doing it properly. Yes. Well, I don't think that un until we had the Kubernetes API, mm -hmm. it's been very, it's been a lot harder to achieve. And now that we have this standardized API for delivering cloud native software, whatever that means, yeah, we have 
these GitOps operators that can suddenly operate in a very high level of, of efficiency where you have very little drift and things like that. I mean, we like we we use Terraform, right? Everybody uses Terraform, mm -hmm. but Terraform state management state gets corrupted all the time. Right. And right. so that makes it a lot more difficult to use in a proactive GitOpsy way. Uh, whereas if you're using Kubernetes, Argo CD is going to be perfect. It's just going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what's what do you feel like the, the kind of learning curve is on um, kind of doing the GitOps model? Um, not so much the, the technology involved, but like kind of the mindset. Do you think that's a, is it a, you know, difficult thing to come across or is it, do you find most people get it pretty fast? It does take, there are some people who look at it and they say, well, you know, I run a CI CD pipeline and I'm a big fan of CI CD, CodeFresh is a CI CD company, mm -hmm. but they'll, they'll say, well, I run a CI CD pipeline at the end of that, I have a step that, that executes a deployment. Mm -hmm. So how is this better? Mm -hmm. And I, I get that because <laughs> if, if you, if you don't start doing it, you might not realize how much easier it is. Right. Uh, and you might not realize like how much time you spend babysitting deployments or like if you ever have a deployment go wrong during a CICD process and you haven't written some sort of imperative case for it. Mm -hmm. If you're really good at writing imperative operations, you can make it feel almost declarative. But as soon as you go outside the bounds of what you can imperatively script, suddenly you run into problems. And so something... That's like, we moved to declarative for a reason. Right. We moved to declarative because it's way easier to operate and you know what you're going to get at the end and you can have operators and policy that gets you there, but you can just worry about being declarative. Uh, so moving from imperative to declarative for, uh, on a CI CD perspective, I think that's something that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. Right. Um, the other thing that we see a lot of is just bad Git management. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's not shocking. <laughs> right. But uh, if you're using, when you're doing app development, you're using branches for all of your development and Git flow and that's great and it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. When you start to do environments, doing Git flow and having branches, like a different branch for different environments, that's actually really awful. Like it doesn't work very well. And it creates a lot of problems because you're like, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote a change from staging to production. And what does that entail? Oh, I need to cherry pick 37 commits perfectly. Right. Okay. Uh, good luck. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's probably, you're probably going to have merge conflicts. It's probably going to be a pain. And if you bring one of the values along with you that you didn't mean to, suddenly you're going to be in, in trouble. Whereas what we recommend is do it using an environment per folder. Oh, yeah. Okay. And now running diffs on that, super easy. You just diff two folders, you've got it all figured out. Right. Uh, promoting changes and segregating things that are long running values for staging or long running values for production, that's a lot easier. So things like that, those are pretty common. One of the things that uh, I, I was kind of, you know, it's like you learn things sometimes and, and you're like surprised that that's the really interesting thing you learned. Mm -hmm. So one of those for me, when I joined Red Hat, it's after I was there for a couple of years, is how much better at source control I became. Uh -huh. um, because, you know, like Red Hat, you know, is, is really, really good at that, right? It's really good at, uh, you know, kind of this very machine approach to releasing. Because, you know, like Red Hat's been doing essentially continuous delivery for 20 something years, yeah. right? You know, it's just, we call it package managers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's really, it, it was really interesting how, how much I learned about how like software is really created and like the best practices around it and the pain when you don't do it right. Well, that's, um, that's a good use case to get your engineers, not yours, but yours writ large yeah. to contribute to open source Yep, because Git management and open source is act, tends to be actually very good. Right, right. Because it has to be. You yep. have you have 5,000 contributors to this thing, so you need to have really good Git hygiene. And so I'm working on Argo, and um, I've been doing uh, some security work recently. I'm on, um, we, have, we, we created a special interest group focused on security for Argo. Mm -hmm. And so I've been helping doing like cherry picks and things like that. But there's a lot of things that I've learned by doing this with open source that I didn't learn just contributing code into a company organization where maybe, right, right. you know, most companies don't have code owners files. Right, right. right. 
That's a yeah. that's an open source thing. Right. Well, and and I think the other part too, which um, you know people don't really realize, right, is that you know when you're publishing code internally. Um, you don't have the fear factor of, oh my God, everyone can see the terrible thing I did in this piece uh. of software, um, you know, or at least not as much. Um, you know, so I think one of the really cool things, one of the really freeing things in a sense about open source is not only do you get a sense of, um, you know, hey, I'm going to put this in public, so I better do a you know a good job. But also, you get the the feedback that you did do a good job, you know, uh, which I find sometimes uh, really interesting. Well, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, you're more, more likely to get a complaint <laughs> about what right. you've done. What, yeah. yeah, but at least you know uh, you know when it's when it actually gets accepted and consumed, uh, you're like, well, no matter what they said, right? It, it they shipped it, so it must have been pretty good. Um, well, and you can see. Uh, one of the common things in our industry is imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. technology is so vast yep. that you're always going to run into something that you've probably never heard of. Mm -hmm. And the person you'll be talking to knows all about it. Right. And you'll be like, right. oh, I thought I was like a senior engineer. Or I thought yeah. I was a, good, a junior engineer and I don't even know what he's talking about. Right. right. And with open source, you know, you can sometimes have that alleviated a little bit because you'll be looking through something and you're like, oh, they forgot to squash their commits. Oh yeah, and yeah, I can yeah. see that they were just like pushing like all these <laughs> little nonsense perfect. changes, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, and you're like, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, even senior engineers need to uh, send a few extra commits sometimes. That's right. not so bad. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, yeah. I mean, one of the things I, I talk about a lot actually is like uh, one of the best things I learned in college was really actually how to learn mm. um, and how to learn quickly. Uh, I think I spent a bunch of years in consulting, which also taught me a lot of that. Um, but the, uh, you know, because the, the industry is just changing all the time. I think I've gotten to the point where I just assume I never know anything. Uh, yeah. And that way, you know, that way I'm like good to go. Um, I had a conversation with a friend years ago. It, and actually he was focused on Kubernetes because he's, he's a senior engineer. He was one of the most brilliant engineers I've ever known. Mm -hmm. He's uh, like learned a lot from this guy. And anytime I talk to him, I always thought, oh man, I, I have a lot to learn. And one day I was talking to him about some stuff with Kubernetes and containers, and he had no idea what I was talking about. Oh yeah. And I was like, "Whoa, yeah. did that just yeah. happen? Right. Like, I actually right. know something that you don't. You didn't already write like a doctrinal <laughs> thesis on this thing." Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah, it's I, it, containerization. I think in particular, uh, I I find that a lot where it's like somebody who I know knows technology really really well, and then is like has never been anywhere near a container. Yeah. Um, which I find interesting because like I got into them because they made my life easier, you know, because I didn't have to like spin up a VM every five minutes Goodness to gracious. you know work on a project. Um, so yeah, huge fan. Uh, so, uh, you know, we call this the insider show because, you know, we want to know what you think is coming. Um, so what oh, are you boy. kind of most looking forward to coming through Argo or even CD, um, you know, or kind of those concepts? What do you think is the, the thing to watch or the thing to be hoping for in the next, I don't know, six months, a year? Hmm. Let me think about what, because <laughs> there's stuff that you know I'm, uh, we're I'm like betting our company on. Oh yeah. Uh, well, that I don't necessarily yeah. <laughs> want to like go as deep into those things as much. Uh, but like, there's definitely more democratization of these tools and technology. And mm -hmm. I think going back to your puppet example, orchestrating GitOps 15 years ago. Mm -hmm was kind of a dark art. Right. It was yeah. like you had arcane knowledge, you had these super specialized people that like if they ever disappeared, you know, your company's mm -hmm. just going to collapse. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's nice for the people who are getting the paycheck, but now with tools like Argo, it's becoming so much easier. Right. And so right. it's becoming more accessible, and so we're just seeing this huge explosion of people doing it. And since, you know, 3 years ago, when we started telling people, hey, you should be using Argo, you should be doing GitOps, here's how you should be setting up your repositories, the value wasn't necessarily immediately clear to everybody, mm -hmm. but now you can definitely feel that push. So I think a democratization of that is happening that's really exciting. Obviously, machine learning and, and AI is a very hot topic, and there are a lot of ways we could apply that within software delivery. Yeah. And they're not necessarily always, uh, comfortable because if you have something like oh I want to you know have an AI watching all of my logs and all my metrics and looking for anomalies and have it automatically trigger rollbacks most people don't 
deliver their software without a human clicking deploy. Right, right. So how comfortable are they going to be with an AI doing a rollback in an automated yeah, yeah, way? Yeah, yeah. But I think we'll get there. I mean, it's, it's like driving a car. Like 10 years ago, the idea of an AI driving a car was, oh, I could never trust it. Mm -hmm. And now we still don't trust it. But we could see a future <laughs> where we might trust it. Right. Well, the, um, yeah, it's, the other part that I think is really interesting around the kind of AI ML problem for those scenarios, too, is the... Um, you know, the changing baseline um, where like, I, I still remember talking to a friend of mine who like was running a company that did, um, uh, you know, log analysis basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what was really interesting was that their big thing that they were trying to figure out was like, how do we recognize when the baseline changes so we can stop alerting you, which, because now this is just a normal day. Um, and I think that's where, you know, things like machine learning yeah. really start to come into play and get interesting. But I don't know that we, you know, the problem with machine learning is that you need a lot of data to, uh, you know, get good models. And I don't know that we have that in any sort of unified way, because one thing we're not seeing a lot of in kind of the open source world, at least yet, is, um, the sharing of how your, you know, GitOps, whatever um, environment works uh, so that we can kind of be learning more from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, that still, that tends to be a very, I don't think it's intentionally secretive, but it tends to be secret. Um, and so I think that'll be a really interesting, you know, kind of breakthrough when people start getting a lot more, I hesitate to say open as much as like, it becomes more of its own community. Yeah, I, I don't. I wouldn't hold my breath for people to be start sharing their data too quickly. Well, right. But. Yeah. So that's that's the other <laughs> challenge, right? Yeah. But, but yeah, the, the and then there's definitely a lot of like uh, nuance in how you train those algorithms because you could see scenarios where oh this this is learning and it's learning how to detect the it's learning how to detect anomalies mm -hmm. but anomalies are building up slow enough over a long period of time that it assumes that anomaly buildup is normal mm -hmm. you know and so yeah. you can see a situation where it's sort of like you're slowly boiling the frog right, right. and you didn't get to the point or you it, get a rollback because you're not getting enough errors you know yeah <laughs> yeah it's like oh i expected more errors right. better better roll back <laughs> right this yeah. is the devil I know. <laughs> right, Not exactly. ready for this new world of no right. errors. Right. Um, yeah. Although, although to be honest, right, as a human who has some level of at least intelligence, um, I have looked at systems and been concerned about it because I'm not getting the errors I'm expecting. Yeah. Um, and, and been right occasionally, right? Where, uh, you know, it, the reason you're not getting any errors is because it's completely broken. <laughs> you know? Well, that's the old joke. Uh, what scares you more as a software engineer when you make a change and it works the first time without errors right, right. or uh, you get errors that you know. Right, right. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, if I, if I get no errors, that definitely makes me think I missed something. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I totally hear that. Um, so uh, I was going to ask you kind of a, a little bit of a sidebar. Um, yeah. I was uh, doing a little bit of background on you and uh, saw you did a backpacking trip around Europe. <laughs> yes, years ago. Yeah. Yes, a uh, long time ago. And I was in Holland. I had some friends in Utrecht. Oh, cool. Utrecht. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that, if that's how you that, say it. That Utrecht. was pretty close, I think. It know. sounded it sounded like I knew what I was talking right, about. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, we uh, I we stayed in Utrecht. We went into Germany, went into Switzerland. I slept uh, on the street in Switzerland. Oh, that's always not uh, comfortable. I was a poor college student, you know. Uh -huh. I went to Sicily. I slept on the beach in Sicily. Nice, uh, nice. So that was a lot of fun. Um, got in a motorcycle accident. Oh, that's nice. And uh, that yeah. was, you know, an adventure. Right. Yeah, yeah, great adventure. Yeah. Would you do it again? Oh, well, I would go back in time and do it again. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I've got four kids now. Yeah, right. right and right. I would go backpacking with my kids. Yeah, I'd okay. do that. All right. Well, because it was funny. Like, I, um, I think I was talking to you earlier. I, I drove uh, from Prague to Krakow mm. uh, for a conference. And I am really glad I did it. And I will never do it again. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never, like, yeah, maybe, maybe if one of my... I don't know if I can handle one of my kids driving. My kids are inner city kids. Oh, boy, yeah. Nothing okay. I'm driving. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, it was, it was great once, um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, so I have to find another opportunity that was similar. Um, there's a guy I used to work with actually who everywhere he went, he would drive. Um, and I always thought it was kind of crazy. Oh, I think that was the left I wanted. Um, 
Well, oh, well. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Eventual Eventually. consistency. Exactly. Eventual consistency exactly. is all we care about right. in the uh, software delivery world, <laughs> GitOps world. Um, so, uh, yeah, the... Uh, so it was kind of a lot of fun. So I was kind of curious about the, the backpacking experience the same way, you know. Um, but it sounded like you'd repeat it, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I did it, I actually, I was doing it and I didn't have a job. So I had, I had worked mm-hmm. and then the company I was at, um, and I was like working my way through college and uh, the company I was at downsized and I was like a college student. And so I didn't have a job. Mm-hmm. And... So I, and I had already booked my ticket to Europe. So I came out here with like almost no money yep. and spent a while. And I, you know, I, I would buy like a baguette and some cheese for two euros. And that was like the day. Right. And right. I was, I had a train pass, so I was just moving around and stuff. And, uh, it would definitely be different now because you know, I can, I can afford to buy food. Uh-huh. So uh, that would be yeah. a pretty definitely exciting. A step up. Yeah. 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 I hear you. Um, yeah, it's cool. Um, I still, I'm, I'm kind of jealous that you, uh, had the opportunity, opportunity to do it in the first place. Oh yeah, um, of course. Uh, yeah, I did manage to, uh, get to Prague while I was in college, you know, but mostly just like a trip. Um, and we went down to Rome and stuff, but it was much more of a vacation than it was, a you know, kind of a long tour, you know? Yeah. And I mean, now that, now that you put it as like, would you do it again? We got robbed five times. <laughs> Uh, we got uh, accosted by a soccer team that had just won a championship and was okay. high on cocaine. All right. All right. Uh, we got, uh, you know, in a motorcycle accident. Like, it was high adventure. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, adventure comes with a lot of stories, and it's great to look back on. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily do those parts of the adventure again. Right, right. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, that, that was kind of how I felt about the drive to Poland, was that, you know, it wasn't, you know, didn't have any of those kinds of problems, but it was like, the, the adventures were great, you know, things like not being able to figure out, we wanted to go to a restaurant for lunch and yeah. we couldn't figure out anywhere to park. Like had no idea because we were in this tiny little village and we had no idea like how you went about parking, you know? Uh, and so, and of course didn't speak the language in the right. Czech Republic or Poland. Uh, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of, you know, stupid little stuff like that, which, you know, is really kind of cool to, to experience, but not something, you know. You don't want to do it every occur- day. Right. Yeah. And it never would even occur to you that these are the problems you're going to have, you know? Yeah, the, the the misadventures need to be infrequent enough right. for their novelty to outweigh their <laughs> Terror. displeasure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, I totally hear you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you think, um, you know, CD is, your, is the thing, is what uh, you're going to change the world with. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing, yeah. That's uh, awesome. But it, it actually, I mean, we're pretty lucky working in software because... We work with companies all the time that are changing the world. Mm-hmm. And I know it's cliche and I don't talk about it much because it feels a little cliche, but yep. like if I help a team at a healthcare company deliver software faster, mm-hmm. it's like literally saving lives. Right. And right. I'm not smart enough to save lives directly. Right. So if I yeah. can save lives indirectly, that feels pretty good. Like I'm happy I can contribute to that cause. Software is amazing in that way. Like well, you, you can touch so many things. Well, it's particularly interesting that you you mention that because um, one of the things that so in some of the classes we teach uh, that you know like I teach and I help oversee and stuff, um, uh, we do these projects for uh, third party organizations like nonprofits and local government mostly. And what's so interesting about it is uh, trying to get the students to recognize that you know every row of this table is a human a lot of the time Mm -hmm. and that that's so important uh and you know we we try very hard to uh make sure that they recognize that you know it's not just data right it's it's real people or real you know something uh and getting and i think it really starts to appeal to the students that way where it's like hey i am i can make a difference without being a doctor right um yeah we we talk a lot about empathy within DevOps, within mm-hmm. software. Mm-hmm. And I've I've started actually, uh, I'll phrase it poorly. I've started <laughs> to move away from that. No more empathy. Okay, no. all right, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've started to move, yeah. yeah. No, I've started to move towards uh, charity. And the way that I think of that is empathy plus wisdom. Uh-huh. Because somebody delivering software poorly or someone having a bad experience, you can empathize with them but not necessarily have the wisdom to, to help 
in any way. Right. To know right. what to do. And so you could say, oh, you're doing this. This is really hard on you. You know what? You should quit software. Right. That's right. very empathetic of me. Right. But if maybe charity is saying, oh, this is really hard. Here's how you could fix it. So I've started to say, you know what? I think you need an extra part of the equation. So not, not moving away from empathy, but empathy plus wisdom, charity. Interesting. Yeah. Because I, I mean, that's, you know, sometimes with empathy, it's right. It's like you can be maybe potentially more proactive than empathetic, right? Yeah. It's kind of what you're getting at. Because I can yeah, feel cool. bad for someone, but right. then not actually be helpful. Right, right. Whereas if you can do both, it's even better. Yeah, then it's um, amazing. Well, thank you so much for the time. I yeah. really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope you had an enjoyable dr- drive. Thanks for the drive. Do, do, I, do I tip or? Yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. You can, uh, you can tip your way to. Okay. Um, but, uh, <laughs>